Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is a great pleasure to welcome you all to the Core More Link webinar series. Uh, I, on behalf of Al and Martin, uh, want to thank you all for accepting our invitation and participating on the webinar today. As I mentioned in the previous webinar, uh, we would be focusing more on scientific advances uh, that the, each of the core modeling themes are making uh, in this webinar series. Uh, for your information, uh, we have eight different themes in core modeling who are working on different topics uh, mm -hmm. such as special metrological forcing data, uh, Jewish special intelligence, current generation hydrological modeling, next generation hydrological modeling, hydrological forecasting, water resource management, water quality, and hydroeconomics. Today, we'll be hearing from the special metrological forcing data team. Uh, the other themes will be presenting their science advances in the subsequent webinars. Uh, we'll be having Professor John Pombray from the University of Saskatchewan in next month. Uh, we'll be presenting on advances in next generation hydrological modeling, so please stay tuned. The webinar today will run for an hour. Uh, it will consist of about 45 minutes of presentation, uh, followed by 15 minutes of question and answer session. Uh, but you do not need to wait till the end to ask uh, questions. You can type in your question anytime during the presentation and I will relay them to the speaker at the end. Uh, please note that the attendees will be muted, so you will have to type in your question. Uh, also, the Zoom webinar functionality does not allow attendees to see each other, so you may feel like you are the only one attending uh, this webinar, but uh, we have about 50 people already uh, joining today. Uh, so uh, I think that's all the housekeeping. Uh, today we have Professor Julie Terrio from the University of Quebec at Montreal. Uh, Julie is the theme leader of the Special Meteorological Forcing Data theme. Uh, this theme, among others, focuses on production of high resolution and continental domain meteorological uh, data that are useful for studying historical and future climate and also providing inputs to hydrological models. Uh, Julie, we are very happy and grateful to have you here today. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Prabhin. I will share my screen. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Thank you for the uh, introduction. So, um, good afternoon for those in uh, at are in Eastern Canada, and uh, good morning for those in Western Canada. So, I'm very happy today uh, to uh, give you an overview of the activities that uh, we've been doing in this section of the core modeling in uh, the advances in special meteorological forcing data. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm a professor at the University du Québec à Montréal in atmospheric science. And my research focuses mainly on winter precipitation, the forma formation mechanisms, occurrences, and also uh, analysis of future changes. Um, I use in my research um, observations, but also simulations, and that's why I'm involved in this, uh, in the core um, modeling team of GWF. So uh, today, um, this is, I'm the presenter, but actually I, this is a, a presentation that I've put together uh, with the material for everybody who's contributing to this section. So uh, the faculty members involved is, um, are Martin Clark, Yang Ping Lee, John Pomeroy, and Simon Papalexiou for the University of Saskatchewan. And I'll be presenting uh, the research activities conducted mainly by the HQPs involved in the section, Koi Chang Tang, uh, Zen Hua Zhang, Lin Tao Liu, Du Saskaf from the University of Saskatchewan, as well as Melissa Chalet from the University of, of uh, Quebec and Montreal. There are also uh, many collaborators from the National Center for Atmospheric Research, from Environment and Climate Change Canada, as well as from UCAM. So the goal of the presentation today, as I said, is to give you an overview of the research activities that is being conducted in this particular section of the core modeling team of GWF. And also, in addition to that, I'll give you examples of uh, scientific applications that can be done with uh, those uh, data sets that are being uh, uh, developed in this section, and in particular, applications that are being done in uh, funded pillars one, two, and three projects of uh, GWF. 
So the goal of the of, of this section is um, to gather and to produce surface meteorological data to study past and future climate that include also uh, studies of extremes, uh, extreme events, climate related extremes, as well as to conduct some hydrological modeling. So here I put a, a, a image of the water cycle to show that if we if we uh, have information from the surface, we also need to consider you know, the full uh, atmosphere as well as lab. So in the meteorological uh, data that we're producing, it also involves, for example, in the regional climate simulations, the 3D simulations of the atmosphere, then the surface, and also some uh, uh, surface and ground information. So those products develop filling the gaps into existing data sets that already exist for Canada and North America. So a, a list, uh, an extensive list of uh, data set is, uh, is being developed in this section by uh, Fabin. And um, so we're almost ready uh, to share it with the GWF community. Uh, this list with an, uh, implies um, all the station data that are um, uh, open access, the model simulations such as um, Cordex simulations, for example. So it's a list of data that could be used in your an analysis. So the approach taken uh, into this section of the core modeling team is, is divided in, in uh, I would say, in uh, three parts. The first part, uh, but in five points. So the first, the number one here is to gather and merge multiple graded and station uh, database. And uh, number two, three, and four are mainly working with uh, regional climate simulations. So contributing to the, the major effort that is being done at NCAR now to, to run 20 years of, uh, of work over North America, and then apply virus corrections to some of those simulations to use another model for uh, flexibility into the time period, for example. And then the third part is uh, to produce uh, future climate scenarios using CMIP-6. And this is an end-time contribution uh, from a newly funded Pillar 1 project. So I will go through the different uh, projects. And uh, just to give you uh, an overview, and then I would encourage you, well, you know, then you can see who did the, the different projects. I encourage you to, uh, to um, if you are more interested into the details, to contact um, the, the, the people involved. Um, so the first one I want to uh, discuss is the data set over North America. That is, um, is it, this is done by a PDF, uh, Gochan Tang, under the supervision of Martin Clark. And uh, basically, what Gochan is doing is he's developing uh, data sets for North America using a combination of station observations and uh, as well as reanalysis product that are available. So for now, Gochan has uh, accomplished uh, this in two steps. The first one is the reconstruction of uh, station data and produce a serially complete precipitation and temperature so daily data, data set over uh, North America. And this data set is available now in, uh, in uh, a description of it is available in ESSD. Then a follow up from this is the production of an ensemble of graded precipitation and temperature uh, database. So just to give you an idea of, of what is uh, uh, the SCDNA, uh, basically, uh, Gauchen used uh, more than 40,000 stations that exist over North America through uh, the NOAA um, uh, stations over the United States, the Environment Canada and Climate Change stations as well here, and also the Mexico stations, and also, as well as uh, three sets of reanalysis such as R5, uh, a Japanese reanalysis as well as MERA. So this is just to give you an, an idea of the different steps. So basically, uh, Gaochen prepare, unify the precipitation database from the multiple sources, and then downscale the reanalysis to estimate uh, the different values at the different station, 
and, and use this information to fill and reconstruct the database to produce um, a station database over North America from 1979 to 2018 using uh, those 16 uh, strategies here to, to reconstruct it. So at the end, Gaochen used um, around 27 stations for his studies. So this was pushed a little bit more further to, uh, to producing an ensemble of meteorological data for North America using the station uh, data, so the SCDNA, -S -S as well as the reanalysis product uh, perform an uh, interpolation to produce um, an ensemble of 100 members of the um, of a daily precipitation and uh, temperature as well as the probability of precipitation. So there, so here this is uh, in preparation. Uh, so the paper will be probably be submitted soon. So if you uh, want more information, you can contact Gaochen or wait for the, the publication. So this is where it is uh, now in terms of the development of the different uh, North American uh, um, uh, station-based data. So as I said, uh, the first one, the station-based data, is the daily temperature and precipitation for almost 40 years. And then there's an ensemble of 100 members also that will be available soon. So now to the second section, which will describe the very high resolution regional climate simulations that are uh, conducted in collaboration with the National Center for Atmospheric Research in uh, Boulder, Colorado. So uh, Yang Ping's lead group collaborate with them and help them to produce the runs. And also some simulations are being done with the Canadian model uh, at UCAM. So the different model used, the WARF, research, research, uh, weather research and forecasting. Uh, so it's used over uh, a large do larger domain, I would say. So, so this is, for example, the CONUS 2 simulations where it covers most of, uh, of North America. Check the time. So it covers most of North America. And uh, this is an example of a domain that is used now with uh, the GEM uh, model, which is smaller and a little bit more flexible. So, there's, so the GEM model here is just used uh, to complement, I would say, the, the work simulations. For example, if uh, some events that we would like to study are not included into uh, the time period, for example, simulated by WARF. So for the WARF simulations, there are, uh, there are uh, three sets of data, two that are available now and one that is uh, being done now. So in blue, so here I match the domain uh, color with the, the name. So there's the Western Canada domain conducted by Yang Ping Lee's group. Uh, it's the CCRM uh, uh, simulations. In green, it covers uh, most, well, it covers the United States and also all of Southern Canada. And then in, in, uh, in purple, then this is the CONUS 2 simulations uh, that are being conducted now at uh, NCAR. So I will give you a little bit more detail about those um, uh, available uh, model output. So here I combine the CONUS-1 and the Western Canada simulation because they use very similar uh, configuration. So for example, but you can see that the, the domain is, uh, is, is quite different. You know, the Western uh, um, domain is much smaller than the CONUS uh, domain. And both, both simulations are at four degree and four kilometer grid spacing with 37 uh, levels. Same microphysics scheme, but the time period is slightly different, 2000 to 2013 for the CONUS simulations and an extra two years for the, the Western uh, domain. One simulation used spectral nudging, it's a bigger domain, so then it's, uh, it's better if we want to reproduce the past events. Um, and then for the Western uh, domain, spectral nudging was in use, but it's also a smaller domain. So the force, forcing data are era interim uh, reanalysis that provides the initial conditions and the boundary conditions as well.
So for those two sets of simulation, um, the, the, the past climate were uh, perturbated based on the um, on the projections of 21 uh, GCMs to uh, produce a pseudo global warming uh, simulation. So those fields were perturbated and this is an idea of the, the climate change signal that we could see that there's a temperature increase of up to eight degrees in uh, some uh, region of eastern, uh, <coughs> eastern um, uh, Canada and also northern uh, US. So those are the two reference for the two set of simulations or, or data that are available from for the Western Canada CCRN runs and also over the CONUS runs. So both simulations are available in historical, um, <clears throat> historical past uh, events and also uh, period, I mean, and then uh, also those in PGW in pseudo global warming for the same uh, um, duration. So I'll give you now a, an example of a project that is being uh, conducted in this section uh, of the core modeling team, uh, which is a, a development of bias correction of the work simulation. And this is the work from Zen Hua Li and Yang Ping Li. So Zen Hua sent me uh, those information. The goal of his uh, project is to uh, provide forcing data that can be used by uh, hydrologists to, um, to, to force their model uh, to obtain some hydrological simulations. So the bias correction is mainly applied here. Zen Hua is using the Western domain. So use the WARF Western domain of the simulations and then uh, use also the multivariate method to develop this uh, database. So depending if you compare the data with uh, Kappa or with Anisplin, then uh, you get very different uh, biases that uh, varies throughout the season. Both data sets are at 10 kilometers Kappa would tend to um, <clears throat> underestimate some of the, the precipitation in some region, overestimate another region, and then Anusplin, for example, will tend to uh, overestimate it uh, everywhere in the domain. So then we we'll also compare the different uh, uh, spatial variation to look at the bias. So the bias is not the same everywhere as we can see on the map. And depending where you are on the domain, then you can get uh, very different um, uh, results from, for example, in Calgary, Kappa would underestimate uh, the worth and the station. In Kelowna, it's the opposite. And then if you move over the prairies, then uh, both of them are, are, or the three of them are very comparable. So this motivated the use of the multi-variate uh, bias correction method. So then Hua is using uh, many variables uh, to do it. And uh, it shows that when you correct it, here is the precipitation rate from Kappa and the wharf control, and it, it gives more uh, um, a better, better representation of the precipitation rate. However, when you look at it uh, over a monthly precipitation, we can see that it works well for the, the control, but then the, it tends to uh, lose the, the climate change signal because the distribution of the precipitation intensity uh, changes in the future. So it tends to overcorrect it. So Zendua and uh, Yang Ping are currently working on trying to develop another method that would preserve the climate change signal in using the PGW um, information. Other examples of uh, work that can be done with the CONUS uh, 1 simulation or the Western Canada, I'm thinking about, I, I say both of them because they are both using uh, the PGW approach. So some uh, examples uh, could be, for example, um, here I have some um, 
preliminary results from uh, John and Isaiah's group at the University of Manitoba and the climate-related precipitation extremes, failure three, looking at the size distribution of hail in a control and also in PGW, showing that there's a shift towards larger hail in, in the future. So this is the, the type of study that can be done with those simulations. So in particular, th this is more a statistics, but we can also look at, at uh, single events, for example, in the past and see how those uh, events would change if the climate would uh, in the warmer and moisture uh, climate conditions. So this is other examples of uh, studies on snow or near zero condition. The, the first one here is from a contribution from Lucia, who's looking at the um, a correlation between SWE, the, the snow water equivalent, and also a warm spell, warm, uh, winter warm spells. So when the temperature reach uh, zero degrees Celsius, how does the, the, the SWE uh, 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 respond to this? So you can see as an example here, this is for the 2003 to 2004 um, uh, season. We can see that the, the, when the temperature is uh, above zero here, then there's a, a, a large decrease here in, in SWE. And other, other studies, for example, in mountain water futures from uh, Ron Stewart's um, uh, group, University of Manitoba, uh, that looked at the, the changes in rain snow transition over uh, Western Canada. So mainly showing that um, there's a, a much larger change here in the, the, the height of this uh, rain snow transition over Western Canada compared to uh, uh, the uh, more Eastern side of, those, of, the, of the mountains in Western Canada. So this is also due this change to the fact that uh, surface data was used in a lot of uh, relatively warmer systems too, or rain snow transition uh, uh, were much higher than, than uh, the surface. I should also mention the, the interesting part too, that the gray um, rectangles are the, the height and location of different ski resorts. So just comparing the changes in rain snow transition uh, for the different ski resorts that are operating over the Rockies. So as I said, you can also use the CONUS simulations and the PGW approach to, um, to look at uh, particular case studies because they are well, well reproduced in, the, in those simulations. So for, this is an example from my, my student, uh, Julien Chartrand at UCAM. So he used, for example, uh, um, events that were identified from NB power that caused damage to the infrastructure that were able to uh, find in the database. And then we're able to look at how those events, if exactly the same event occur in warmer conditions, how would, the, would it change, for example, the precipitation distribution? So Julien find that um, south of New Brunswick, so in, in this region, so, so there's often um, a lot of freezing rain in this region of New Brunswick. And this is a cause from um, the, the cold air uh, staying near the surface, so cold air damming process in, in this area of the province. However, in a warmer climate, we don't see as, as strong of this effect and then the freezing rain migrate more towards the north. So this is a composite of uh, seven events in the in the past, and then in how would the precipitation distribution will look in the in a warmer and moisture climate. So those are uh, some examples, but then there's there's a limitation of of uh, of using a PGW, and one limitation is how would the storm track would you look like, for example, in the future. And that's one of the motivation of conducting the CONUS-2 uh, simulations. Um, so the CONUS-2 simulations are, are led by the uh, National Center for Atmospheric Research scientists. And GWF contributes and help producing and post-processing uh, the outputs. In particular, Lin Tao Liu 
and Lucia Scarf uh, in Yangping Lee's group. So I will give you an overview of uh, the configuration and what you, you could you would be able to do also with those uh, with those simulations. So this is the domain. So you can see that it's much bigger than the, for the the Conus One simulations. And then the Conus One simulation is was uh, two thousand five hundred per two thousand five hundred approximately kilometer square. And this one is is uh, it's much bigger. So it extends further east. So we can um, look at uh, the maritime provinces, not entirely. Newfoundland, but the, all the maritime provinces is there and also up uh, to the north as well. So those simulations are, are for um, 20 years, 1995 to 2015. And to um, assess also the added value of the high resolution of using four kilometer, there's also a 12 kilometer run that is being done at the same time. So the, the simulations over the continental US uh, is done one, one at four kilometer and one at uh, 12 kilometer resolution. So the simulation is, um, is conducted with uh, an ensemble of a climate model. So it, it's not forced by ERA like the Conus One simulations. So it's a, it's a climate simulation that is being conducted. And uh, different parameters are being used. They are similar than for Conus One with some um, improvement. For example, cloud fraction has been added. Uh, and also, uh, I think that groundwater has been improved as well. So there's no cumulus uh, parameterization that is used and uh, some is used at 12 kilometer. So this is for, give you just a, an idea of the, um, of the configuration. And the, the forcing data, um, this is a method that was developed by Igo Dae. And uh, so it's basically using um, a, a perturbation that is uh, climate perturbation that is uh, corrected by um, the reanalysis. And then after this is used to uh, force the, the, the regional climate simulation. So for doing these runs, it requires a lot of, um, of steps and it's a, it's a, a lot of work. And this is a summary that um, Yang Ping's group sent me about how, what are the steps into uh, performing these, these type of uh, simulations where there's a, a lot of simulation design and testing that has been done. So I'll, I'll repeat it once again, because it's important. So the lead is NCAR, but also GWF is helping a lot into the testing, the running, the, and running the model as well as some post-processing and, and archiving of the data. So there's a lot of work that uh, needs to be done into making sure the parameterization are, are right um, for, the, for the different uh, details into uh, how the computational and also some experiments need to be done where, for example, if you uh, add a cloud fraction, what's the impact? And once the, the model is ready, to be uh, the runs are ready to be launched then um, send, so the model will run and then the data needs to be uh, post-processed at the same time <laughs> so this is just giving you an idea of the different steps that uh, that need to be done this is for uh, for the historical simulation but then some future simulations are being done using an ensemble of CMIP5 models that will uh, be used to uh, to force the model and this is also for for 20 years so the simulation um will this is a for example an, an overview of the output variables that will be uh, available uh, 2d variables um, also 3d variables if we're interested about the atmospheric conditions a lot and the mixing ratios if we're interested into the precipitation 
um, and also the the variables such as temperature specific humidity at the surface and 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 wind speed and so these these variables will be available uh, to use in uh, in our projects so Lucia Scav sent me some uh, initial comparison of snowfall between Conus 1 and Conus 2. Uh, we can see uh, this is on the left, there's the Conus 1, uh, 4 kilometer, um, and then Conus 2, 4 kilometer, and 12 kilometer to look at the uh, added value. And then you can see the, the domain here, you know, the domain of the Conus 1 would stop here in the middle of British Columbia, and then an extend uh, much nor uh, farther farther north in the Conus two simulations. Um, we can see uh, also a comparison. The Conus one and the Conus two are at the same resolution, so we can see um, both models are are output are similar, and we see lots of details over the mountain peaks. And then, but we don't see as much detail in the 12 kilometer, which is expected to because the mountain are not as well uh, resolved in a 12 kilometer grid compared to a four kilometer grid. Another example of what you can do uh, as a study with the Cornus 2 is looking at storm, storm tracks, for example. Um, so if you look at the role of the the role of the storm tracks versus the warming of the changes in in precipitation so conus one would give you how would the precipitation uh, distribution change in a storm that would be reproduced in a warmer climate and the conus two would give you information on on the on the changes in in, in storm tracks for example so so here this this is not from conus two this is just from era five giving you an idea of the different storm tracks that can uh, be associated with uh, extreme precipitation over the maritime provinces. And uh, now uh, uh, with the CONUS 2 simulations, so those, those uh, changes could be, uh, could be investigated. And that's a plan for the phase two of a, of a pillar three project. So um, the other section, is I just want to give you a, um, an overview of what we have been doing um, in terms of the GEM simulations. So those simulations are, are conducted at uh, UCAM on uh, Compute Canada and we just started a, a few months ago. So we use GEM already in, uh, in GWF. Uh, for example, there's a recent paper from uh, Vincent Vionnet showing that um, the added value of using a high resolution up to one kilometer to represent the precipitation over the mountains. Also in the pillar three project, we did the simulations over uh, the maritime provinces to simulate a freezing rainstorm in January, 2017 um, at one kilometer resolution as well. And uh, so this, this storm could not be added in the analysis of uh, using CONUS 1 um, or CONUS 2 because they're not in, in, um, included in those simulations. So we just did our, uh, a short case study simulation here to be able to, uh, to do a, a process study of this uh, freezing rainstorm. And uh, this is just show you also the a map of duration of power outage because this is applied also to um, user needs. So we decided to start uh, the simulations over a small domain over Western Canada, the Rockies, just because we have a high resolution frequency data. They are available in, in this region. Um, and then, so we started to do uh, uh, we started with uh, different domains that um, that has been tested because we need to find the optimal configuration. Ideally, what we're looking for is the best configuration for the um, the best representation of snowpack during the cold season, and also the best timing of precipitation phase and intensity during the spring the melt season. 
So in addition to multiple domains that we're trying, we also try two versions of the of GEM. We started with the uh, GEM4 and now um, ECCC is now using GEM5. So we we now are able to use uh, GEM5 as well. And this is uh, giving you a list of uh, simulations that we're being testing because we're also testing um, uh, the, 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 the downscaling uh, technique that will be used. So should we go directly from L5 to 2.5 kilometer resolution or we need to have an intermediate uh, simulation at 12 kilometer in between? So in this list, uh, the color correspond to the domain and two steps or three steps, it means if we two steps is L5 and then uh, jump to the to the lowest, um, highest resolution, or if we go to intermediate uh, uh, resolution. And then to start with, since that our uh, data is available uh, for, uh, we have high frequency data at the surface, but also a lot for two months in 2019. So that's why we decided to, um, to focus on, on during that year. Uh, we use a P3 microphysics scheme. We were aiming for now to use a 2.5 kilometer resolution of the model. And then we're using ISBA because that's the closest version of, of a gem that, uh, so we decided to go the, to, uh, to, to use this one. And just to give you an idea, this is the, of the behavior the, the, of the model. So we see on the left uh, temperature bias and the precipitation bias. And then uh, surprisingly, we would thought that the three steps, if we have an intermediate simulation, we would get better results. But in both temperature and precipitation, the bias is, uh, is higher. And then we notice if we use uh, the two-step uh, GEM simulation without, with spectral nudging, then the bias in the month of May is much larger than if we don't use spectral nudging. And the difference between these two simulation is, uh, is mainly the representation of the surface. So in this one, it was not represented well, and this one, the crop was uh, added to the, to the surface scheme. And then uh, to give you an idea of the, uh, how does it compare to a station in particular? So this is just a, a comparison, just to give you an idea, uh, overview of the state data. So we had three sites, it's the storms and precipitation across the continental divide experiment. So we have three sites with a high temporal resolution of, um, of uh, measurements of temperature and precipitation accumulation uh, across the continental divide. So one in Nipica, British Columbia, located at the, at the lower elevation, and then uh, two at, um, on the eastern side of the divide, one at higher elevation power line and one in junction. So there are many lines here, but you can focus on the black one which the black one is the uh, they met kappa and also uh, what's measured by the gauge. And the red one, which were, which are the, the gem five two steps uh, with and without spectral lodging and with uh, the different uh, surface uh, representation. And um, so you can see that none of the simulation really reproduce well any of the of the data but maybe the red one here for example at Nipica is is close to the to the dash line to uh, to kappa here but it, the model tends to overestimate the precipitation at Nipica so Nipica is a place that we saw during state that was really dry so um, uh, maybe here there's um, the, it could be the microphysics representation of a solid precipitation uh, in the model. So we need to investigate a little bit more why it, it, it is uh, this way. We can also see dry conditions on the western side, but during spade it was not as, um, as common. But interestingly, in power line, you see that all the models, they're not too far apart and they're 
some of them are really close to the what's measured for the pluvio, but this is uncorrected for, for snow. So for snow events, uh, I think we need to add a little bit more uh, precipitation adjusted with the wind speed. And this is a junction. So in this uh, area, it's, it's also challenging here. Uh, it's lower elevation, but it was uh, common to observe mixed precipitation. So we're, we're now analyzing in detail the, the evolution of the phase of the precipitation to at, uh, in particular in those two locations to see how well the model is able to reproduce the phase of the precipitation. So next step is to, this, these were two months, so we want to conduct a one year long simulation, try to, to see if we can um, validate for the cold season snowpack accumulation and then the precipitation uh, intensity in the spring season and see if we can do what 10 years, maybe more, maybe less, or use different technique to, uh, to be able to, to produce a, a complete data set for, um, for, for hydrological model or to, uh, to study uh, extreme events. It's also possible to conduct those simulations over different domain if there are uh, some interests. So uh, the last uh, part, uh, but not the least, so this is an in-kind contribution, which is uh, very good uh, to the core modeling. It's a newly funded project and it's led by Sigon Papalexiu um, and uh, Chandra Rajula Pati is also uh, is, is working on this. So it's uh, basically using CNIP6 uh, scenarios to uh, to study changes in <clears throat> in extremes in uh, temperature and precipitation in different regions of uh, of Canada. So, uh, for example, <clears throat> this is a um, uh, a graph showing the temperature anomaly with all the different models available in uh, in CNIP six. It just give an idea, as you know, of the the range of solution that the model gives. Um, and also, uh, it's interesting to see that only a few models was able to capture uh, the change in temperature in the last 15 years here in this simulation. So I, I, I had many things to present here in, in this uh, project and I had to cut a little bit. So th this is just to give you, you know, a, a, a range, an example of the range and the challenge also uh, associated with uh, trying to find the best model that would um, uh, represent a region in particular also uh, in Canada. So some, uh, some steps here in terms of, uh, of Simon's, uh, what Simon is planning to do is to uh, develop a complete database uh, comprising CMIP6 simulations, gridded and station observation, and then access to six simulation to estimate the bias and uh, identify the best performing model for uh, the, the different uh, Canadian regions. And then uh, develop a method to uh, downscale um, the, the CMIP6 pro product. And also to create an ensemble of uh, downscale CMIP6 projections for the next 80 years using the different um, uh, shared socioeconomic pathways and so different climate change scenario and then quantify future changes in hydroclimatic variables. So this gives you an idea of this, um, the last part of the research that are, is being done in this uh, section of the core modeling. And I think I'm doing good on time. So it's um, just just as a summary. So as a summary, it exists, as you know, a multiple data sets. Prabin is putting it together and I think we'll be able to share it with the community soon. Under this uh, section of the core modeling, uh, there's some new data sets that are being constructed. Some are being available, for example, the SCDNA one, um, the uh, ensemble, um, uh, metrological data is uh, is under construction. Uh, multiple uh, simulations are being done. Some are available. Western Canada and the Conus One, Conus Two is um, is being done uh, now and should be available soon. Uh, the gem simulations are is also being conducted now. 
there will probably be also um, a database available with that is uh, the Wharf Western Canada bias corrected that uh, can be used to force hydrological modeling. And also in the next few years, next year, need to see with um, with CIMO, uh, but the, some uh, statistical downscale CMIX6 uh, uh, product as well. And here I just wanted to give you, you know, an idea like of applications. So if you want to drive a geological model, um, all that the set can probably be used. There's probably a, a, a specific one depending on the interest. Uh, to validate high resolution simulations because this is really important. We can conduct high resolution simulations, but not having any data to, uh, to validate with. So some station based data set can be used to validate uh, the models if we want to conduct process studies, the work, the gem and also station data can be used. And for climate uh, studies, then CONUS 1, CONUS 2, uh, Wharf Western Canada or CIMIT-6 can be used depending on, on what you, you, you want to do. So next step, this is very, very general, but um, we continue uh, working on the regional climate simulations and developing also the, some targeted database. Um, and then we will link with other sections of the core modeling to test and use those various data database. And also we need to link with uh, other GWF projects that would like to use some of this data. And this would also involve the, the, the data management team as well. So I will stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Julie. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation. Uh, we have some questions now. Uh, so one of the questions is from Joey Lee, and she's wondering if the slides or recording would be made uh, available afterwards. Uh, so the recording of this webinar will be on the website of the GWF. So if you need any link, uh, you can send me an email or you can uh, just find it in the website uh, with the information of the core modeling. Uh, if you need slides, I think you'll have to ask the Julie for that. Um, so we have one question yeah. from Oliver and he's wondering uh, what is the difference between the 100 members in the EM DNA data? Oops, what did I do? So, okay, I'll try to answer this question, but Kao Chen would probably do a better job than me. So I'll go back to the slide. How can I do this quickly, uh, Robin? Okay, I'll go back here. So, so in, in this slide here, so the 100 members, can you still see my screen? So they're mainly produced here by through a different uh, statistical um, uh, techniques. So it's a probabilistic estimation. I, I think we need probably have uh, Gauthier for more detail. And Martin has also wrote that he sampled from probably distribution of the precipitation to produce those 100 different uh, uh, ensemble members. Super, uh, thank you, Martin. <laughs> we have a next question from John. And uh, so his question is that, uh, so he's saying that it is, uh, we need to think about the ways to incorporate the best possible ways for the precipitation and wind undercast in our data products. And uh, being in, in Canada, you know, it's always snowy and always windy. So at least we need to incorporate those things in our uh, products and also in moral evaluation. Uh, so is there any thoughts on that one? Yeah, this is a very, very important question. So uh, we need to, uh, to take into account this, this uh, impact because uh, as John says, I, I see his comment here, it's, yeah, it's, it's easily the order of two. And it also depends on the, on the climate, I would say indirectly, because if you are in a dry environment and you have dry snow, then dry snow will tend to fall less in the gauge than wet snow that fall faster. So some area probably more, need more correction than other uh, areas. And uh, so this is definitely uh, an important uh, aspect 
to uh, take into account into the development of database. And um, the state data I show, like the, the evolution of the accumulated precipitation, these are not corrected, um, for example, but we need to be careful on how to correct it because in some uh, station, for example, junction, there was a lot of mixture. So we have to make sure we don't correct for winds the, the, the samples that, uh, that, are, that, are, that includes rain or very, very wet snow. So that's excellent comment. And also I would like to add in that if I'm correct then for the SCDNA and EM uh, DNA, uh, I think Goshan is working to, uh, to, to address the undercats in the next phase. So the first phase was just generating the data and then next phase uh, he's specifically, specifically looking to, to address those issues. Uh, yes, have, that's correct, yeah. So we have another question from Rajesh and he's saying, could you give me more info on the CMI, CMIP6 downscaling and what will be downscaling target, which variables will be downscale and when it will be available? Okay, so I can give you a little bit. So I know that uh, precipitation and temperature for sure will be downscaled. And um, if I uh, remember correctly, we need to confirm with Simon but we should have a first set of, uh, of data available in a year or so. So that is the information I have and maybe Simon can, can uh, complement this uh, uh, as well. All right, uh, we have a question from Valika and she's wondering uh, all this data, it's nice to see all this data being generated, but uh, can you comment on why the data was stored in the uh, Zenedo over the GWF stories, you know, because it was in the FRDR. So I think it was related to the SCDNA data where it was stored. And if the metadata for all data sets will be available on GWF uh, meta catalog. Uh, yes, every all the metadata should be uh, available. The, um, for example, uh, it, it's required to deposit the data we we use and uh, we develop in GWF in a, well, for example, in a repository like FRDR. So this should be available through, well, the core modeling uh, will, would produce them and, and gather them and the data, uh, data team uh, would be um, responsible of uh, providing them to the, to the community. So enough um, information should be there. And if there's not enough information, please ask your questions and we'll try to help you as, as much as we can. Yeah, and I also think that uh, for, the, uh, for the publication, it was easier to put into Zenodo and to get the DOI. So maybe it was the reason that it was initially, uh, the data was there. But I think the data is also available in the FRDR uh, uh, stories. And I think uh, Martin just confirmed that it's stored in the both places. And the plan is to move the metadata to the GWF metadata catalog. So, so we'll be coordinating with the data team uh, to work on that one. Uh, we have another question. And, and Martin, sorry, Martin, Martin mentioned that uh, the data is stored at both places. The yeah. OI are available too. Uh, we have a question from Mohammed El Sami, and he's asking why it wasn't mentioned about the CAN RCM for data set that was bias corrected uh, some of the work that Elvis did. That's an excellent question. Um, well, here in this presentation, I presented mainly the um, what the the HQPs are working on and some application that I was aware of. And then I, I, I wasn't aware of the paper in the, for until a, a few days ago. So just uh, honest, uh, and then I should have mentioned it in the presentation, but this is, yeah, this is for sure the Ken RCM and the, the, the that was the, in the bias correction paper from uh, ESSD that is published in ESSD. I think it's in March this year. It's relevant to this for sure. We, um, Prabin, I think, is it included in the list? Yes. Of data, yeah. So it's included in the list that we will share with GWF. Yes. 
So all the details uh, related to the, not only these uh, four or five types of data set that we discussed today, but more comprehensive uh, list of the data that we have and others have contributed is uh, is available and we'll be sharing soon with all the GDLF uh, community members. And there's also a comment from Amber and she's saying that the, the data management team is here to assist with you with publishing your data. So if you have any questions in publication, just contact your local data manager. Uh, so I also have one quick question. So uh, for uh, so many land surface geological models, they need uh, not only precipitation and temperature, but also radiation, wind, and other variables. Uh, so I'm just wondering if uh, you know for the SCDNA and ECDNA data, if there is plans to produce these additional uh, variables. Yeah, I understood that there's a plan to add those variables, and uh, so. Oh, Martin just <laughs> is responding at the same time <laughs> to give more details. So, uh, so yeah, the, the, there's the plans. There's just less station that measure this this type of data. So, the less station uh, included in the data in the database. But that's the plan. And are you also planning to do uh, one kilometer gem simulation instead of two point five kilometer to have more high resolution data? Well, it's a, it's a possibility that uh, we can consider for sure. Uh, we aim for 2.5 kilometers because that's what the HRDPS is. It's at 2.5 kilometers. So the, the numerical weather prediction model used at Environment Canada. So we just uh, try to use what they use at Environment Canada and make, and make it work on, on Compute Canada. But if there's a need of using a one kilometer, so we'll, we'll, we can uh, consider that for sure. I do not see any more questions. So we'll just give a few seconds for people to ask any question if they have. And if not, then uh, we'll be moving towards the close of the, the webinar. Uh, so I'll be just counting five. Uh, Yeah, I see no more questions. Uh, uh, thank you again, Julie. Uh, I also want to thank everyone who attended this webinar. Uh, I know we all are having too many Zoom meetings and so these days and, <laughs> and they can be hectic, but we are glad that you could attend. Uh, next month, uh, November 5, we'll be having uh, Professor John Palmer from the University of Saskatchewan, uh, who will be presenting on the advances in next generation hydrological modeling. So please stay tuned. Uh, that will be all for today and thank you everyone uh, for again for attending and participating uh, please have a good day thank you thank you all <laughs>